what, what does it mean that we, on one hand, have to make choices when it comes to tools, but on the other hand, also need to reflect what they do with us? This is a very humble page of an old-fashioned document that shows you that it wasn't... Um, this showed you how to put a paper on a drafting table. And I spoke with people my generation studying architecture, and they said, you never learned that at architectural school. You only learned it when you started working in an architect's office. So, so this is an example for the fact that a lot of things we do in practice are not things we learn at school, but we learn through practice. So there is a history or a story of practice that is very much also an informal one in the way it's passed on. Um, the people who are my age or older remember um, those Wotring rapidographs who I think caused more than one nervous breakdown and um, they were actually introduced in 1952 and um, I think you could call them something like the dinosaurs of the profession because nobody uses them any longer. As opposed to some object you all know and probably have had in your hands very many times, the pencil that is still going strong and I think is not going to be extinct anytime soon. So between the pencil and, um, and CAD programs and um, <clears throat> where the development is going now, I think there is the whole array of tooling that is uh, of importance at the moment. Um, this is the, the oldest um, reference I'm bringing um, during this lecture. It's actually from a book published in um, 1565, and that's the first recorded mention of the pencil. And um, it was actually um, the fact that um, the excavation of graphite had started that led to the process of being able to think and manufacture something like the pencil. And many times, um, sorry, many times um, during my research, I stumbled. Up, I came across the fact that many times it was architects themselves who played an important role in updating the tools of the profession. And amongst those who updated the pencil um, in the late 18th century was um, an Austrian architect by the name of Josef Hartmut. And maybe you remember Hartmut pencils. And um, a lot of architects were actually very fed up with the poor quality <clears throat> of pencils. So there was this innovation um, uh, based on uh, brown graphite <coughs> mixed with clay. And I, I like to draw the attention to this because also today, um, innovation sometimes is based on the fact that something doesn't work in practice, that we're actually forced to make things better in that sense. Um, this um, is the next um, very important step. So we had the rapidograph, as you remember, in 1952. And 10 years later, um, what looks like a whole room is um, actually the predecessor of um, CAD programs. And we see Ivan Sutherland at the MIT and his sketch, sketch pad, which had two commands, um, draw and move. And um, it doesn't only look like a whole room, it did fill a whole room. Um, <clears throat> this is now jumping into the exhibition itself, which was on show at the Architectural Center in Vienna 2008 and 2009, um, winter 2008 and, and um, January, February 2009. And in the middle, um, you see these showcases um, that hosted the collection of tools. And it wasn't really a chronological order because as you have already seen, some of these things have disappeared and others like the pencil and computers um, happily work together or sometimes not so happily. Um, just to run you through what it looked like and what kind of things were in this tool part of the exhibition. Now you see whole, um, the whole range of pencils from um, very soft to very hard. And um, now we jump into the collection of somebody's specific pencil. The, 
The B6 was always considered the master pencil, so to say. Very soft, very smudgy. And as some of you might um, have heard, that was then in the 1980s a gallery, uh, an architectural gallery in London called H9. So also referring to a pencil, but a very hard one. Um, and this opposition already makes clear that there are different intentions at work. And the pencil, the, the yellow clutch pencil you look at here, is actually to be found in Uveskule in Finland in Alva Alto's archive. <clears throat> and um, I, I was there for a couple of days doing research. Uveskule is Alto's some hometown where he grew up. And uh, they house this archival collection. And they told me that no researcher who had ever come there had asked for the tools he had used. But they only keep very few of his tools, um, like the one I, I photographed here. And then you see some more legs and a couple more tools, but not very many. But when you go then to Helsinki, where Alba Alto had his um, office, and now you can um, visit it as a, it, it, it houses the research, but you can also visit it. And uh, if you open the drawers there, it's like an office from the 60s in full swing with hundreds and hundreds of these pencils still around. So what I wanted to point out is this distinction between the object in an archive, like the object with the aura of one and being specific, and then what does it mean that you're surrounded by these things in an everyday use and very often don't even think about what they do with you. Um, Alba Altos um, was a heavy smoker, and um, the back of the cigarettes was often used to denote first sketches. And um, I spoke with um, um, one of his collaborators, um, who originally came from Italy, Visionava, and um, he said that Alto would then come back with the sketches, and that uh, the staff in his office um, would have trained to have the same style as the master to sketch and draw. So that actually, when you look at the things in the archive, you cannot say whose hand it was that did what. And I think that's a very interesting question. What does it mean that one person is actually many hands, and that many hands train themselves to do what the one hand showed them to do? Um, so these are photographs from, from the collection with the pencil in hand. Um, this is um, also to, to remind all of us that um, um, at first Arto worked together with his first wife, Aino, um, who died in 1949, and this is a photograph of their work situation when they were still working out of their home. And then uh, Elisa Alto, who after Alto's death still ran the office, um, and this is already the office that is now um, housing the research um, and is a museum, and till 1994 she then ran the office. And what I would like to point to in this, um, this is the place where um, Alto used to work in the office he had, had designed for himself. And what I would like to draw your attention to is the little balcony upstairs. This is where Alto. Um, so this is what I meant with balcony. Um, this is where um, this is uh, where um, Alto and um, his um, members of his staff would go up to in order to have this bird's eye perspective onto big models, big plans that they spread out on the table. And I think there's also this history of the magisterial view. What does it mean to look at things from above? Um, and then for the exhibition in Vienna, what we tried to do is this um, bring all the things that were representing the, the alto um, to a very low level on the ground so that people who could stand there could have some kind of physical experience of looking down onto something. Now we jump to a very, very different... Um, as you see, I'm taking you through those studio visits for a couple of them, um, just like as if you're traveling with me to, to visit and to see what it means to, to look at, to listen, and to find out, um, try to make sense of what people describe 
in this combination of space and usage of tools. Um, you have 